Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, let me begin by uh, sharing a story uh, with you. Uh, my colleagues uh, said, well, you're going to talk about innovation. Then you've got to use the technology of innovation. So they said, well, you for sure have got to do it on your iPad or on a device. You can't use the old paper copy. So I said, OK. Then they said, well, if you're going to use the iPad, you had to have an app on the iPad. And the app had to stroll, scroll it uh, as you read it. And the strategy, of course, is if you just keep reading to the middle of the screen, you're bound to get it right in timing. So far, so good. So I'm doing this, this thing, but I have a, a tendency to improvise. So by the time I looked down for the next line, it was somewhere in the third row. Uh, as a result, I have got my, my written notes there as a backup in case anything goes awry. So let me begin by, uh, first of all, uh, saying to Rihanna Tra Trail, who uh, introduced uh, herself as an alumni, how proud we are and congratulate you on your new role. So congratulations, Rihanna. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to speak with you this afternoon. I'm delighted that we have had so many distinguished guests with us today, and in fact, uh, the number of people here and the people who are here is overwhelming to me. I would particularly like to uh, mention and to thank our uh, D Deputy Minister, Deb Newman, uh, for being here. Thank you, Deputy. And of course, we are joined by many members of the Ryerson community. And I want to thank all of my colleagues for being here. I want to acknowledge our, our Chancellor, Raymond Chang, as being here. Chairman of our board, Phyllis Yaffe, being here, as well as all the students and the faculty. Thank you so much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, over there, we also have a table of young people from the Pathways to Education. And to all of you, I'm delighted you're here. And I can only imagine, in not too long a time, you'll be here. So welcome to you all. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm eager to speak to you today about the topic of innovation. First, I'm going to address the innovation challenge that I see facing Canada's universities. Then I'm going to lay out Ryerson's response to that challenge. I'm going to show you how we are fostering more market-driven innovation on our campus. And I will explain how we are teaching the young innovators to become entrepreneurs. And I'll explain why this country's young innovators should be clearly the focus of Canada's innovation agenda. Back in March of 2009, I gave a speech titled Building Universities and Cities for the Digital Age. In that speech, I laid out a vision to create a digital media innovation hub right here in downtown Toronto. In that speech, I said the following, we should devise made in Toronto solutions for iBanking, iBusiness, I news, I medicine. In fact, I said I everything. I believe that building the cluster of this strength is really the only way that Canada can compete in the digital global world. We all know that Canada has less than an attractive record, some would say poor record, when it comes to commercializing our innovation. And if this poor track record continues, the consequences are going to be severe. According to an author of a recent report, the quote she said is the following, the world is targeting our intellectual capital and property, and it's leaking out of this country. That leakage is a significant threat to our national prosperity. Canadians should not be selling their intellectual property as a raw material then leasing it back as if it was a finished product. We should be reaping all the benefits of our own ideas and in innovations. But to reap those benefits, we simply must become more entrepreneurial. We must be driven to retain our own ownership of our own innovations. And most important, we've got to be driven to bring those innovations to market. I believe Canadian universities can and must do more to help foster this entrepreneurial drive. Our campuses are filled with bright young innovators. 
And what's interesting, they will come from the disciplines of computer science, digital media, the social science and humanities, and in fact, there is no discipline that is short of having bright minds and bright innovators. But the innovation agenda in our universities is not restricted only to our faculty, but to our strong undergraduate and graduate students that have a passion to bring their innovation to market. And as I said, these students and these young people should be the focus of our innovation economy. So what should we do to help these student innovators reach their potential? I think universities need to take on three additional tasks. First, we need to connect our best and our most passionate innovators to each other, to business, and at the earliest stages. Second, we really need to teach them to be innovators and to be their own bosses. And third, we need to support the kind of research they do, because it's this kind of research that leads directly to markets and to economic benefit. Simply put, the strategy that I will outline is to connect them, teach them, and support them. So let me take them in order. The first task is to connect them. These young innovators need a place to land here in this city or in any part of our country, a place where they are surrounded by other like-minded innovators. That's why in April of 2010, Ryerson opened up the Digital Media Zone. Our students gave it the name DMZ. For those that read DMZ as having another connotation, I will respond, the students gave it that name. <laughs> the zone is located on two floors of 10 Dundas East, and very soon it will be on its third floor. It has tripled in size in the 19 months. The zone is a space for student-driven research and learning. Like all our university programs, there is a very rigorous admission process to get into the zone. Applicants must have a unique innovation and prototype, they must be passionate about their innovation, and they must have a business plan with a clear market. In return, the zone provides workspace to pursue their research together. The DMZ is really a sample of the best young innovators in the city. Right now, there are more than 80 different innovations in the zone. And let me tell you something that really surprised me. Some of those developers, once they were admitted, decided to combine their ideas and pursue new innovations together. So the zone has already proven to be stronger than the sum of its parts. Most of the developers, of course, are Ryerson students, undergraduate and graduate students. But if you went there, you would find some are alumni. You would also be surprised that there isn't a library card admission and that some are from other universities and colleges there. Then you would look around, you'd say, there's some private sector people here. And then you would find that we have invited people from around the world here. And just recently, we uh, were in India and six uh, fellowships were uh, given to IIT Delhi and six to IIT Madras, and we expect not only will they be there, but our students will have that opportunity to be in their country with their innovation. So the zone connects young innovators to government and to business. And let me give you one example of the connection to business. Last year, the Paris Metro launched its mobile transit companion. This is Paris, France. It provided a real-time schedule for updates and station wayfinding and it provided the users of that technology multiple languages. That mobile transit was developed by a team in the zone called Flybits. And the Flybits IP platform was developed by a Ryerson graduate student through his PhD research. In other words, it was innovation built here, based upon intellectual property that is owned here. What's interesting is that Flybits is now developing the context-aware application for Go Transit. So we are connecting, in this example, the innovators to business, not only around the world, but here in our own backyard. 
We are also connecting innovators to investors, and this is truly an important function. The Jenkins Report on Innovation in Canada was released just two weeks ago, and it detailed how hard it can be for Canadian entrepreneurs to find venture capital. Angel inv investors visit the DMZ all the time. And what is very interesting is that when I spend time with angel investors, this is what I hear quite often, that the time spent in the DMZ can be the difference between a lost idea and an investment-ready innovation. The results we've seen so far have been staggering. Since the zone has been opened, you've heard that 36 companies have been started, 300 jobs have been created. What's more interesting as well is that 50 different private sector companies have partnered with the zone. And at the outset, I mentioned that Canada has a problem with intellectual property leaking out of the country. The zone has shown that we can help stop that leakage by connecting young innovators to business investors here. So the first task I see for universities is to connect the young innovators to each other, to business, and to investors. So let me move on to the second task, teach them. Specifically, young innovators to be their own bosses. I think it's clear to everyone that entrepreneurship is going to become a more and more important part of the Canadian economic prosperity agenda. And I think Canadian universities must adapt to this emerging reality. We must prepare more students to work for themselves instead of for someone else. Let me put this issue into some context. When universities are trained a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, a journalist, a social worker, and in many other fields, we give them hands-on experience. And at some point, we expect them to be able to do that, that professional work without a life jacket. But what about students who want to own their own companies? They need the same sink or swim learning experience. But Canadian universities, as, not as a rule, provide this kind do not provide this kind of sink or swim learning experience to students who want to start their own company. I think entrepreneurship is a blind spot. When governments want to know how well universities are doing their job, they ask us, how many of your students found a job in six months of graduating? How many found a job within two years of graduating? They never ask universities, how many of your young students started their own company? How many incorporated, incorporated their own company? Or how many hired their first employee? Universities need to offer better hands-on education for students who want to work for themselves. Even at Ryerson, where we're proud to say at the Ted Rogers School of Management, we have the best entrepreneurship in the program, we know we can do better, and I want to thank my colleagues for being the ones who said this hands-on experience is essential. This is what the DMZ does. In fact, our faculty of entrepreneurship played a key role in creating the zone. The young innovators in the zone aren't working on a class project. They are trying to build a real business around their own innovations. They have the drive, they want to own their ideas, and they want to commercialize them. The DMZ is for people like them. It's where young innovators learn the path that can lead their raw innovation to a profitable market venture. And they are not learning that path by reading about it or by watching someone else walk it. They are learning that path by actively taking the risk that all entrepreneurs must take and must learn. It's the best way to learn and it's how they want to learn. And we certainly have no shortage of young people who want to apply to the zone. So this is what zone-based learning can accomplish. It can expose young innovators from any field to the real-life rigors of launching their own business. So that's what I would say about teaching them. So let's move to the third task, which is support them. Support young innovators in their core endeavor, namely taking their research and moving that research to market. 
Let me start here by making a key distinction between discovery-based research and market-driven research. Most discovery-driven research is conducted by university faculty. Its primary goal is to expand the frontiers of human knowledge. Its goal was never meant to commercialize that application. Discovery-driven research is essential part of what all universities do in this country. Market-driven research lies further along the spectrum. It's about finding solutions to immediate and pressing needs for innovation in business, government, or the voluntary sector. It's not about products of widgets alone. Market-driven research can also be about improving public services and business processes. But it's the kind of market-driven research that is being undertaken in the zone. Some people argue that we, would, we spend too much money on basic discovery research. I disagree. It's worth every penny. Canada provides financial support for discovery-driven research throughout its life cycle, and it has made us world leaders. But we should also support market-driven research throughout its entire life cycle. And we have recently begun to move in that direction. The Government of Canada has created new programs to encourage more market-driven research within our universities, and so has our provincial government. These are welcome changes, and I urge them to continue down this path. To improve the commercialization record, we must support the kind of research that is driven by market needs. A university is a logical setting to channel and deliver this kind of support. We can deliver that support by creating the new research spaces, spaces that are dedicated to market-driven research and providing the young innovators their space. That's what the DMZ does, and that's who the DMZ attracts. So there you have it, three tasks. Connect innovators to each other, teach them how to be their own bosses, and support that research. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can accomplish these three tasks to help, we will help stem the tide of intellectual property flowing out of our country, we will improve our track record on commercialization, and we will lay the foundation for industry clusters that can compete globally. And perhaps, most important, we will create a community and a country of entrepreneurs. I want to stress that the zone is not the only model to achieve these objectives. There have been other successful initiatives as well. The University of Waterloo's Accelerator Centre, OCAD University's Mobile Experience Innovation Centre, George Brown's New Gaming Incubator. These are the kinds of learning environments we need, and I believe we need more of them. And we need strong incentives for post-secondary institutions to create them. Canada's innovation agenda is really starting to take shape. The Jenkins Report has helped move the discussion in the right direction. But as we move forward, here is my concern. I fear that Canada's innovation agenda will bypass our most talented and driven young innovators. We, can afford, we cannot afford to bypass them. Yes, we will need the right tax incentives for business. Yes, we need a strong venture capital sector. There are indeed many, many parts of the puzzle. But in my mind, it's young people who I would put my money on as creating the next wave of innovative ideas that will be commercialized and truly stop that leakage. Post-secondary institutions are the place to reach them. And if we fail to make them active participants in the innovation agenda, we will miss the mark. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the best way to illustrate my point is to let you meet some of these young innovators. And since we could not bring everyone in this room to the DMZ, we have brought Digital the DMZ to you. So if we could roll the video. Digital technologies are transforming the world in which we live. Canadian education has the opportunity not only to be a part of this global change, but to lead the way. Right behind me is the DMZ, Ryerson University's Digital Media Zone, a centre for innovation, collaboration and creativity. It's also a place where entrepreneurial students can not only work on their degrees and doctorates, but simultaneously create the digital solutions and businesses of tomorrow. One of the challenges for innovation in Canada 
is that we don't have a strong culture of innovation. How do you build it? Well, you've got to start at the grassroots and you have to look to where are the innovators and how can we support and encourage them? It's very unique that you have a place that has all of these disciplines working together. And it is that cross-pollination of skills and expertise that really makes the culture of the zone as special as it is. The, what Ryerson has been able to do is to provide a focal point where people of great knowledge, uh, great ideas, have been able to come together and work together, being sort of the catalyst for each other. Flybits focuses on the convergence of artificial intelligence, mobile computing, and social networks. Sounds impressive, right? It's even more impressive when you're in an airport and trying to figure out where to go. Flybits started as a research initiative about five years ago, focusing on this concept of context-aware computing, meaning that instead of asking people to search for the information like on Google, we have an intelligence on the internet and in the cloud that understand the intention of the user and will be able to send the information that the user is looking for when they need it. Think about an unfamiliar airport. You go there, you don't know where to go. You will see these signage systems at the airport. If you look at it, you don't infer much, but if you point your phone to it, we will be able to tell you where your gate is, how long you need to get to your gate, and the distance to your gate. Our research has contributed to the emergence of a framework that allows anyone to build intelligent mobile applications without writing a lot of code. The role of the DMZ is to help commercialize that research. We are actually making the outcome of the research tangible. How would we know if we're succeeding, if the digital media zone is succeeding? Well, I'll tell you one obvious measurement. The number of enterprises that are started by young innovators that are not only transforming the way we use technology, but they're creating jobs as well. With his startup, ARB Labs, Adrian Balzaki has taken his PhD research and turned it into a successful business. He now employs over 10 students and skilled professionals and is shaking up the way industry uses digital technology. All of this is based on advanced level research, cutting edge research right now. What that means is it's uh, things that um, take the most advanced types of maths, sciences, uh, all the different research fields and bring that together into something that we can, that's, that's sustainable today. If you commercialize research, it means that you genuinely want this out there. With this, I graduate already with a successful high-tech company. I've already learned business, the legal aspect of it, uh, protecting my ideas, but being able to license them out internationally. That's what I leave with now. I hit the ground running. By bringing all these people together, giving them the opportunity to build something, create something, invent something, and produce it for the benefit of society, is making them entrepreneurs at a younger age and proving that things can really happen. When people think about digital technology, they usually think about smartphones or the internet. But what about our bodies? Bionic Labs is looking at existing medical technology to identify opportunities for innovation. There are lots of companies doing medical devices, but most of these corporations are so huge, they lose sight of, can this person actually afford this device? When you have a person in a wheelchair telling you that they can never afford a device that exists to allow them to get out of a wheelchair and walk again, we can make a device for you that gets you out of that wheelchair for one-tenth of the cost. So we're not creating the next cool thing, we're creating something that has a, a huge social impact. The DMZ gave us the infrastructure that we needed and the networking and funding as well as material and computers to start what we had. And because of that, now we have manufacturing people that are manufacturing our legs. We have doctors that are working on their art devices and all of these people got their jobs because the DMZ was there to say, there's a pathway for you guys. We've had people come to us who have billions of dollars and these people want to talk to us and then we realize this is much bigger than what we ever imagined, that we can lead uh, a company that we can start something and create something big. Even for 10% of our graduating population, even 10%, if they graduate, in one hand they're going to have their degree, in another hand they're going to have their company. And it, they can accelerate kind of moving things towards commercialization and creating jobs and, you know, helping the economy. Well, I think we're in a very strong position as young people to be able to create something new. By DMZ having success stories, people see those success stories. So if you see those success stories, you're gonna, your mindset's going to change. I think that it gives people such a huge opportunity as to how they want to solve these problems. And they, they come up with new creative solutions of how to simplify life, how to improve life, how to uh, bring products to market. 
I can't imagine any alternative to this because of how fun and easy and exciting and just thrilling this whole process is versus the alternatives. The DMZ uh, area has really proven uh, that young people can create things way before they graduate. To create things and to uh, make uh, improvements to the world that, that we haven't seen before. Young people now are working in a realm that has never existed before. We can't think the way we used to, that we knew the answers. I don't think that we do. I think that this space enables the new answers to emerge. This is absolutely essential, and it points towards a transformation in higher education in our country. I'm not saying the Digital Media Zone is the only example or the example that everyone else should copy, but I think the spirit of what actually goes on in this place should be looked at for the insights it can provide in building our genuine culture of innovation in Canada. By helping students transform great ideas into real products, real businesses and real jobs, the DMZ is showing the way to success in today's digital economy. See for yourself how the future could look. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by uh, saying that I think it's urgent that we move in this direction. I want to share with you a story. Uh, I was talking to Nadir Mohammed, the CEO of Rogers Communications, not long ago, and I was uh, bragging about the different innovations that I was seeing, and Nadir said to me, at any given time around the world, there's 20 different groups that are working on that innovation. So the question is, who's going to be successful? Which two or three is going to be successful? Which one will be successful? Will it be the one in Canada? And will Canadians, in fact, develop it? I think we all know that the answer to those questions must be, yes, it will be in Canada, and yes, Canadians must develop it. I hope you've seen a glimpse of what is possible. It's possible at Ryerson. It's possible everywhere. What it takes is for us to believe in our youth and to put them right at the forefront of the innovation agenda of our country. Thank you very much.